morning everyone, welcome to Woolaware Shores Chapel, it's great to have you here. Thank you for making the efforts to come uh, amidst all the challenges that uh, creep into our week. Uh, it is a real encouragement to have you here. We are just on the, the other side of Easter and we continue to work our way through the resurrection appearances uh, that Jesus had. To so, say, look, you know, often we concentrate on Jesus' death and uh, we don't concentrate very much on all the different times that people saw Jesus after he arrived. And so this week and next week we get the chance to concentrate on those. And our hymns, accordingly, concentrate on them as well. So would you please stand if you feel comfortable and we'll sing our first hymn, Thine Be the Glory. So let's take some time to do that now, to uh, confess our sins between us and God, and then we'll say this general prayer of confession together. Let's take that time now. Together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbours as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. 
We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbours and to live for your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we're assured that we're forgiven because if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And just to show I didn't completely make it up, it actually comes from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. In a moment, Pauline Blake is going to come up and read Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Uh, and even just before that, Gary's going to come and introduce it for us first. But before we get to that, let me pray for Gary, for Pauline, for the uh, proclamation of God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can hear your word, that your Holy Spirit can work it in our hearts and minds, and we pray that he would do that today. And as Gary proclaims your word and explains it to us, Please help him to be clear, to be faithful, uh, and to, for, for his words to burrow deep into our hearts so that we act upon them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Gary. Friends, good morning. It is great to have you with us this morning. Great to have you with us. As Paul said, we're continuing on in our uh, right to the end of Luke's Gospel, looking at all that Luke unpacks for us in the resurrection appearances of Jesus. Sometimes I think that we, we look at Jesus' death on Good Friday, Jesus' resurrection on uh, Easter Day, and sort of then we move on. But we've taken this time to unpack all the resurrection appearances that Luke kindly records for us. Uh, in his gospel. Uh, friends, you know, sometimes in life it's easy to see what's going to happen next uh, in the next uh, circumstances of our life. You know, if Joe Locke walks around the village and she sees people who are, um, you know, whose walking is getting more and more unsteady, what's the next thing Joe's going to do? He's, she's going to get to a walk, isn't she? Eh? We know what's going to happen next. We know what's going to happen next. That's partly what life is like. But when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, uh, for Jesus' followers that first Easter day, working out what happens next is not nearly as straightforward. Not nearly as straightforward. Uh, here we have a crucified and buried leader. But the women come back from the tomb, they say, The tomb's empty. And more than that, there were angels there who, who spoke and said that he's not here, he's risen. Well, what happens next? What happens next? It all seems very confusing. Well, Paul Lee is going to come out and read for us now the next thing that Luke explains for us in his Gospel about what happens next. Thank you, Paul Lee. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, 
and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, <coughs> Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Pauline, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, friends, that crushing sadness of the past few days, the confusion of the morning, and the, and the ever so slight ember of hope that the women's words had created. Cleopas and his friends, they're talking about all this as they set out uh, on the two-hour walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And into this uh, conversation about what's been happening and about what all this might mean comes a stranger. Now, whether they were kept from seeing that it was Jesus because of their grief or because their hearts and minds were closed to the possibility that Jesus could rise, or whether it was some extraordinary quality in Jesus' resurrection <coughs> body that kept his identity um, uh, from being seen, we don't know. Maybe it was a combination of all three. But, but you would have thought, I mean, logically, at one level, uh, it would have been easier for Jesus just to come up to travellers and say, well, you know what, boys, here I am. It's all okay. You know, it's all over. It's all right. I mean, it would save the war, wouldn't it? But Jesus knows that for these travellers, it is vital that they go on a journey. Not a journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus, but a journey in their view of reality. From their view of what they think can happen to a real view of reality to a view of God's reality. A, a, a view of reality where the resurrection of God's Messiah is not some freakish, unnatural bolt from the blue, but the resurrection of the Messiah is what happens next. So Jesus joins them in their conversation. And Cleopas and his friends, as we heard uh, Pauline read to us, they're hurt their loss, their confusion about what had happened, it all just pours out, doesn't it? You know, they say Jesus, he had all the marks of being God's Messiah. He was powerful in word and deed. He raised the dead. He cured the sick. He taught with real powerful authority. And yet our own religious leaders, they, they turned him over to be killed. He was, he was so great, 
How could it all end so badly? And as their hurt comes out, what they also see is that they have a flawed view of reality. They were so sure, as the screen says, they were so sure that, that Jesus is the one who is going to redeem Israel. And by that, what they meant was that God's saviour king would be the one who would be great, like a great general, and he would free Israel from the rule of the Roman Empire. But the stranger wants to show our travellers that that view of the Messiah is absolutely untrue. And it's untrue because happily it does not accord with God's real promises about his Messiah. He says, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things, then enter his glory? You see, Jesus wants to explain from God's word, as it were, the real picture that God had given them through his word, through the prophets and the book of Moses, books of Moses, the whole Old Testament, about how Jesus' ministry was really should really happen unfold. So the journey to Jerusalem, journey to Emmaus, becomes a two hour walk through the Bible. Now I know that some of you have done overseas trips and you've done in the footsteps of Jesus, in the footsteps of and so on. Well here, as they travel from Jerusalem to Emmaus, Jesus takes them on a tour of the Old Testament concerning everything about himself. All that was said in the, in the scriptures, in the Old Testament about himself. Now we, Luke doesn't tell us which bits Jesus particularly drew the, the attention to of the travellers. The whole Old Testament is about Jesus, about the need for Jesus, about the sort of qualities the Messiah would have, about what the Messiah would need to do, about the climax and cult, um, the climax of his ministry. We don't know the bits that Jesus particularly focused on. I mean, he, he might have looked, gone right back to Genesis 3. Remember in Genesis 3 where, where we're told that the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, they will be at enmity. But eventually, God will, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. God will raise up a saviour for his people who will deal with all the impact of the evil one in, it, in people's lives. In the, we remember in the Psalms, remember that, uh, remember that powerful cry in Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God's Messiah will experience the forsakenness of God's face turned away from him as a consequence of the sin of men and women. Or in the prophets, remember the servant of the Lord, um, in the book of Isaiah we're told that, that the servant of the Lord, he will be pierced for our transgressions, he will be crushed for our iniquities. That's exactly right. Not only will the Messiah experience forsakenness from God, but he will have to pay the punishment for the sin of all humankind. Don't you understand, this stranger says to the travellers, don't you understand that the Messiah's suffering, the Messiah's suffering and before his glory, can I say, the Messiah's suffering before his glory, that's the way it's meant to be, Jesus says. For the Messiah to be the king of God's people, he must first yield up his life for them. He must suffer for them. He must pay for their sin. And in that very process of suffering, God will make his Messiah fit, right, the one who can genuinely and rightly rule God's people. And then God will give him authority, give him authority over everything, 
the suffering one who is now the triumphant one. In the book of Daniel we read this. God will give him authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The whole thing you think has gone terribly wrong about this person Jesus. But I'm here to tell you that if you see what God has promised in his word, if you see God's reality as he's promised it to you, if you take your blinkers off, everything that's unfolded is exactly what was meant to happen. It's okay. Everything is on track. It's all under control. And the more that Jesus, although they don't know it's Jesus, the more that this stranger explains God's word, the real picture of the real Messiah becomes clearer and clearer as opposed to their idealistic superhero view. As that becomes clearer and clearer, the more they see that Jesus' life and his death, it all makes much more sense. It all fits. The pieces of the jigsaw come together. And as the death, as Jesus' life and death, as it seems more real, as it seems to come together, then maybe, just maybe, the words the women were told that morning, he is not dead, he is not here, he has risen, maybe those words will be are real. Maybe that is what's happened. So as the stranger is making the scripture so real and relevant, the scriptures are making sense of everything that happened. For him to walk on and end the discussion seems so plainly wrong. So they say to him, stay, stay, stay and have dinner with us. Come with us. Break bread with us. And so they stop. They dine together. Keep showing us what God's word is like, what the real Messiah is like. So as they dine together, and as he gives thanks for the meal and breaks bread, who do they recognise they're with? Jesus himself, that's right. They might, whether whether uh, the, there is a change in appearance, whether they see Jesus' hands, we don't know whether they seal the nail marks. But they recognise the stranger for who he is. It is the master. It is Jesus himself. And all that he has told them from God's word about the way of the Messiah, his life, his death, and his coming back to life, they know to be absolutely rock solid, ironclad true, because Jesus, the Jesus that they know, he is right there with them at the table. Jesus is alive. And he is alive because that's what God's declared promise was. His resurrection is not a fluke. It's not good luck. Jesus is alive because God's plan is that that's actually what happens next. Despite the fact that that we know the travellers now, in their excitement, they're up and on their way back to Jerusalem. But in terms of their spiritual understanding, the travellers have already arrived. They arrived at that dining table because it is there that their eyes were opened, there that they recognised Jesus and they realised the complete trustworthiness of God's promises about his Messiah. And what do they do next? Well, they track back to Jerusalem, happy to tell everyone about the risen Jesus. And when we get back there, they know that Jesus himself, and we know that our others are now talking about the risen Jesus too. But they understand that that's what's supposed to happen for God's Messiah. Well, friends, as we journey on in life, 
with all the highs and heartaches that life brings us, the question that uh, we have to answer is, are we journeying with Jesus? Are we journeying with Jesus? I don't mean do we have an idea that Jesus is somewhere out there, somewhere in the background, but are we journeying with Jesus? Are we like those blokes on the road? Are we journeying from Jesus and learning from him? Are we letting God's word change us, grow us, and mature us? Are we letting God's word show us who Jesus really is? Because as we do that, in all that comes our way, as we do that in all the medical stuff, in all the family things, in all the things that happen around the village, as we do that in all our relationships, here and elsewhere, what is true is that we have with us the ever-present, sure foundation of God's real Messiah with us. The one who was crucified, the one who was dead, and now the one who has risen. We have him with us as our constant rock and our eternal salvation. Friends, no matter what happens next, let's journey with Jesus. How about I pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. We thank you for Jesus' kindness to unpack the reality of the ministry of the Messiah. Lord God, we pray that we would grow in our understanding of the ministry of the Messiah so that whatever happens next, we know that he journeys with us in all that we experience. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Sometimes that journey that uh, we go on to discover who Jesus is and what he's done can be longer than we expect. Uh, a friend of mine became a Christian uh, years ago and he talked about the fact that at the time he was part of a band that spoke anti-Jesus songs. And it was a good six months before he realised, I really shouldn't be in this band singing against this Jesus I now believe in. So he told his bandmates and they never talked to him again and that was the end of the, end of the band. But it takes... You think, what took him so long? It took him six months. But it takes time for that journey that we go on to recognise who Jesus is. We're about to stand and, and say the Apostles' Creed, and it took ages for people to really work out what the Bible was saying about who God is and what he's done. And we say this creed to remind ourselves because it takes time for us to really recognise who Jesus is. And this helps us to continue to journey with him. So if you feel comfortable, would you please stand and we'll say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you feel comfortable, please remain standing as we'll sing our next hymn, I Know My Redeemer Lives.
Margaret's going to come up now and pray for us all. Mm -hmm. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. <coughs> Risen Lord, faithful and merciful, we bring our prayers for all your people. Hear our prayers this day and answer when we call on you. Loving God, we see so many places in the world in need of peace and healing. In the Ukraine, Sudan, Yemen, Israel, and other places of conflict. Through your risen power, heal and renew that people everywhere may live in justice and without fear. We pray especially for aid workers in, the, in Sudan, for those who preach the gospel there, and for the United Nations staff. Lord, may your spirit of protection cover them and open a way for them to safely escape the fighting. We continue to pray for those countries experiencing drought, especially in Africa, and we pray for deep soaking rain to refresh and bring new life to the land. Lord, we give thanks for those who lead and have authority in our nation, that they will be committed to their roles and lead honestly, justly, and wisely for the good of all. We pray for one of our local members of parliament, Mark Speakman, recently elected as state leader for the Liberal Party. May Mark know your grace and look to you, Lord, for wisdom and leading. Grant us patience, Lord, and put a right heart within us that we will support what is good and just in the world and work toward maintaining the life and the beauty of your creation. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, Lord, we pray for your worldwide church, for a community open to the leading of your spirit and for passion in proclaiming the gospel to the world. You came as the promised Messiah to teach us the way to live, saving us from our sins and showing the way to life eternal. May this message of salvation continue to be proclaimed and bear much fruit. We thank you, Lord, that Case and Sydney Bootsma are serving you in an acting position at Beverly Hills Anglican Church. As they recover from COVID, may your healing hand be upon them, strengthening and renewing. Grant them wisdom to know how to care for and to lead this congregation. And at St Phil's at Caringbar, we ask your blessing on their Associate Minister, Peter Tuck, on Steph and their children, Ivy and Edward. Guide and direct Peter as he oversees the small groups and young adult ministries. We think too of Nathan and Tara Swift and Charlie, Lucy, Annabelle and Thomas. We give thanks for the coffee shop ministry in the Gordon Community Centre and for the contacts and outreach possible through this venue. Strengthen Nate in this endeavour and in the presentation of Jesus in a more familiar and comfortable setting. And as the building continues next door, we pray, Lord, that you will lead those you want to become residents, to choose to live in a Christian community and help them in what can be a challenging time in life and help us to be welcoming, to enfold newbies into our community and help them to settle. Lord, as your church militant here on earth, help each one of us to be diligent in prayer and in Bible study to be sacrificial in time and money, and in the power of the Spirit, show forth your love to this needy world. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, Lord, we come humbly before you to pray for all who need healing. As we consider our families and friends, 
and those who live and work in this lovely village. We pray for relief, for comfort and for healing for all who might suffer in mind, in body or in spirit, who are sick or in pain, who are undergoing tests, special treatment, an operation or recovery, for those who are anxious, fearful or depressed. We remember those listed for prayer in our newsletter and we think especially of those in hospital, Jan Buckley, Jean Miller and Bruce Wilson. May they be expertly and diligently cared for, but may there be compassion in their care, Lord, and may they know your presence. Lord, you opened your word and revealed yourself to the travellers on their way to Emmaus. May we continue to seek you in your word, to feel our hearts burn within us as your spirit reveals and makes you known and as our need for a deep and loving relationship is fulfilled. We pray this morning in the name of our dear Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now would you like to join me in the words of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Uh, friends, in just a moment, uh, we will sing our final uh, hymn and then Mark, um, uh, Paul will come and close our service for us. But I just want to bring you one or two notices uh, before uh, we do that. Just a reminder, friends, that our uh, Willoway Shores Anzac Day service is on Anzac Day. 10.30 um, uh, here in the chapel. We're fortunate to have with us uh, Chaplain Andrew Nixon from the Royal Australian Navy. He'll be our speaker We've got local uh, politicians uh, joining us, so that will be a great thing. And I know that there are various people working very hard in all the different parts to make this that a special occasion. So everyone's welcome to join us uh, on uh, uh, Tuesday morning. And just a word of thank you to all those people who've contributed names or photos to our uh, World War II uh, little uh, PowerPoint presentation. Thank you to people who've taken time to do that and shared that part of their family with us. Very grateful, very grateful indeed. Uh, just a reminder that because our Anzac Day service is on, our uh, village prayer meeting won't be on uh, that morning. And uh, later in the week, we'll have our monthly Thursday chapel service. That'll be 11 o'clock on Thursday in here in the Reef Centre. So that'll be another special time uh, to be together. Uh, thank you to everyone who's made this morning work. I want to thank our, our welcomers, and our morning tea team will be ready to go. I want to thank uh, our music team uh, and, all, and our technology team, uh, all those folk who've taken part in the service. Thank you for everyone uh, doing their part so that we can be built up together. But friends, we're going to sing our final hymn together now, uh, To God Be the Glory. So if you're able to stand, please stand as we sing together, To God Be the Glory.
service, can I just say thank you to everyone who has helped us out with the service today. A special thank you to David, who's come in specially for us to play, so thank you very much. And we've got new people on PowerPoint over the last few weeks, so please be nice to them. Uh, if something's going wrong, don't look at them. It's embarrassing. But otherwise, thank you so much for coming. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds and the knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us 